All right, well, let's get started. Uh, we have a really exciting agenda today. I want to make sure we get uh, some good discussion and get to see some cool demos. So uh, everyone, uh, welcome to the Linux Security Special Interest Group. Uh, my name is Riaz, I'll be driving. Uh, we're having an agenda here today that's in the Git repo, uh, if you want to follow along, uh, but it's listed out here. And for future meetings, we have uh, other agendas there and you feel free to contribute. So today we have a proposal uh, that we kind of touched a little bit on last time about a hardened channel, which is now probational uh, from Casey's suggestion. Uh, Lorenzo brought up some discussion and issue about build chain security. So wanted to give a, a today's date on that and get some discussion in the group. Uh, we have a treat. We have a deep dive on the Mirage SDK project. Um, I want to make sure I don't kind uh, of change, I guess. I know what and I were talking about it, but it's it's going to be really cool demo uh, with type safe system demons building on top of the external Mirage technology. Uh, and then with time at the end, I wanted to leave just a few minutes for open discussion and updates on projects um, and then give you a sneak peek at the agenda for next time. If you have any feedback or proposals, we can uh, also fold that in. So without further ado, let's get started. My clicker will go. Cool. So introductions. I just wanted to open the floor to anyone who's new just to briefly give a quick introduction of just your name and what you're working on. Um, I think we have some new faces this time, uh, especially in that Cambridge room. Um, so if we wanted to just very quick your name, what you work on, uh, for those who would like to, uh, you have the floor. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Thomas Leonard, um, and I've been working on the Mirage SDK, and um, hopefully we'll be doing a demo a bit later uh, of the new RPC system. I'm uh, David Scott. I'm um, just very interested in the Mirage SDK things. So I'm just here to uh, to watch and learn. I normally work on uh, Docker for Mac. Uh, my name is Manu Shaysa, and I'm right now I'm working on porting. Uh, uh, Docker for desktop to to Linux Kit, um, and I'm also very interested in in Mirage SDK. Uh, I'm I'm Rolf, working on Linux Kit. Um, Ian, I work on uh, StormKit Container Day, but also sometimes Linux Kit. Bit. Uh, hello, I'm Tom Agazanier. I'm working on Linux Kit and Mirage SDK as well, and so. Uh, my name is Gary. I'm working in your vector the first time here. Just want to know what's the project. Hi, I'm Mort. I'm uh, partly working with Docker in Cambridge. Uh, I'm working on the Linux Kit ARM 64 port. <laughs> no, Lorenzo, I'm trying to work on Linux Kit to contribute something and to learn something. So, I'm here. And uh, I'm Phil Estes, I work for IBM, uh, Container D maintainer, and uh, have some interest in Linux Kit and where it's going. And uh, couldn't be here last week, but hope to be here pretty regularly. Uh, hi, Mike Gelzer from Docker, uh, product manager. Um, uh, my main contribution today will be to take the notes. So uh, if you're dissatisfied with the notes, you, you can complain to me. Hey, this is um, Manor Kashlin from Intel. I'm part of the Clear Containers team. So, uh, I mean, we, we are trying to implement secure containers through uh, virtualization using Clear Containers. Um, I'm Mindy. I work at Docker. You'll hear more from me later, but I mostly work on Mirage. Great. Hello, with that, my sharing got a little messed up. Let me bring it back. There we go. So, welcome everyone. Uh, really excited uh, with all the new faces and interesting discussion today. So, just some quick minute trivia. Uh, we meet every two weeks at the time. So the next meeting is June twenty-first. 
Um, and if you have anyone that you think would be interested in any of these topics or presenting a topic, please do invite them and let me know if uh, they'd like to add anything to the agenda. Uh, we also have the Mobi forum where I've been posting recaps and updates, um, as well as mirroring the GitHub state of agenda and, and notes. So FYI. And there's a summit on the 19th. If you're into makeup in person. There's someone typing on a keyboard which is destroying yes. my ears. Let me. I think we're good. Cool. So I think the, the first item on our agenda today is uh, we talked uh, briefly last meeting about a hardened channel, had some discussion about whether that was a proper name, um, if that meant Linux kit itself was not hardened, um, and have currently put up a proposal for the probational channel. Uh, for some background to those who are not, who didn't join us last time, we have a really exciting number of projects in Linux kit in the project subdirectory, uh, such as some of the Mirage SDK work you'll see today, uh, WireGuard, which is a very modern VPN. Um, we have some work on Landlock LSM, uh, which is an LSM that uses eBPF. Um, and all these projects are really cool, but there isn't a easy way to consume them in combination that is curated uh, and maintained. And also, uh, Taika and I have, have been have noticed that uh, we're suffering from some, some bit rot uh, from just projects going in and maybe using older kernels or other older parts of the project. And so it, it would benefit from a curated channel uh, for, for projects to go into a channel uh, and potentially for this channel to be a path forward for them to get into mainline Linux kit uh, and provide a, a use case for even upstreaming them. So uh, Tycho, if you could maybe help with sharing the link, we have an RFC um, that we'd like to share with the group uh, and collect comments and feedback on. Um, as I mentioned, high level goals are reduce bit rot, create a curated combination of projects so you can have your Mirage SDK uh, DHCP, which we'll see today, uh, in combination with WireGuard, in combination with land like LSM, or some combination thereof. Uh, and to this, to this point, uh, we'd like to have a, a standardized process to get into the channel, but also uh, once a project is deemed ready to graduate to the mainstream kernel that we ship uh, with Linux Kit. Um, so maybe Tycho, if you wanted to share this, the, your screen with the RFC, that would be helpful. I can do that too, if, if that's easier. Yeah, I posted the RFC in the, um, the, both the doc that we've written about kind of the process and then also my initial pull request um, for this uh, in the Zoom chat, if you can see that. Right. Um, yeah, uh, so kind of just, to go through the doc a little bit, the goals are, my, my main goal is basically, I, I feel like a lot of these projects can, will potentially be uh, used by people who are sort of experimenting with additional security primitives. Um, one that I have not uh, added to the project subdirectory is a tool called ShiftFS. Um, this is basically, if we wanna move towards um, using user namespaces in Docker more, one of the problems that we have is shifting uh, file systems in and out, uh, shifting images in and out of the user namespace ID mapping. And so there's some, there's a two, actually two different uh, kernel proposals for how to do that. Um, and it's not clear that either of them is going to go in anytime soon for, to me, but uh, at least experimenting with it and seeing, I, I, I feel like the, you know, Docker patches will be small. Um, but if, if you want, want to say use user namespaces and then something else like a, a new uh, init or something, there's really not a curated way to say, I want to combine these two projects. So but basically the goal of this is sort of to change the way projects look slightly so that it's really more of a delta on a, on a Linux kit image instead of you can build a full-blown Linux kit image yourself. And so the RFC does this with two sort of unrelated things just to show that it's possible. I chose WireGuard and the IMA namespacing project. Um, but the idea is you have, there's pretty much like three or four components to every project. Uh, there's the kernel 
patches themselves. Uh, there's some config, there may be some command line options you need to do to configure that stuff. And then you have some uh, user space stuff as well. Uh, and most of this is pretty uh, straightforward to merge, uh, assuming it doesn't, you know, like the kernel patches don't overlap. Um, but since uh, most of these projects are aimed at solving drastically different problems, my hope is that uh, they will not overlap, uh, at least. Um, and I think in most cases for what we've got going on, um, it should be relatively straightforward and easy to merge them uh, automatically, at least for the stuff that we have today. Um, so some things too can be imported as modules. So this could be done entirely via just a, sort of a user space um, init package. And Linux Kid already has a nice way um, that's sort of, I've been calling it new style init. So we used to build, in, if you look at some old projects, they build the whole init from scratch, including um, you know, actually having the script that runs as initial init in there and, and everything like that. And these days it's built in a more layered approach. So that makes this, uh, the user space part of this super easy. Um, anyway, does that kind of cover the bases? Yeah, I guess for those on the call, maybe uh, we'd love your feedback on the RFC itself. Don't want to hijack this meeting and deep dive on the entire Google doc, but generally just want to get a sense from attendees here. Is this interesting? Uh, would, are, do you think we're thinking about it the right way? Is there another way you might think about this? Um, just kind of if there's any feedback that's that we, you'd like to open up to this discussion, I think it'd be be helpful uh, for the project and and for how we want to move projects forward. Yeah, so just one thing I'd like to like to see here is we should have you should definitely have one which is all the projects um, and then have others that are you know, select combinations that people have expressed explicit interest in. That way you can have you know, if somebody is just saying, gee, I want to see everything. They can grab it if they decide they, they want to pull things out. They can do that. But if there, there are also things that are yeah, especially pointed that people have actually exp expressed real interest in explicit combinations, then having those um, as well will actually be very helpful and will encourage people to use it. Yeah, I, and ultimately, I think that uh, the RFC now has like a little YAML file. And ultimately, you could you could just say, I want these two projects. And I think eventually, you could just say, I want this arbitrary subset and build your own. Um, and the, 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 qu the question about, do we want to have an additional channel that has everything? Or do we want to just try and promote directly from here to mainline, I think is an open question. But really, uh, I think at least my goal is just to be able to use two things in tandem. Uh, and have some way to build that. Um, so, so yeah, uh, how, uh, how we exactly promote is definitely an open question and something we'd like feedback on. I, th I think those are two separate things though. I think that um, to make it easier to combine two things, we need to, I think that's a general tooling issue and we should work on improving the tooling in general. Uh, the issue of probation and promotion and things is seems totally unrelated to combining things together. Yep, absolutely. My motivation mostly was to solve both problems at the same time. But uh, if if there's some well, question about how well, I think the tooling all all generic tooling should just be upstream to the main repo. It shouldn't there shouldn't be different tooling in a project because the main tooling is not good enough. So right. I'm against having any tooling in a project because this project shouldn't be about tooling, they should be about actual content. So if you've got problems yeah. with the tooling, yeah, I, 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 open I, I, ask for tooling. Yeah, I, I see the, the goal there. Um, I think that in a lot of cases, when you actually get down to the, the case of tooling, you have a difference between production tooling and developer tooling. And 
if you put the constraints that you need to have and the facilities that you need to have for developer tooling on your production tooling, you often damage your production tooling. So that's where I would I would see that you that in although, although I like you know like the notion of the tooling should be good enough for either case. Uh, I think that the reality is, is that sometimes you're better off having tooling which is targeted toward its end use rather than tooling that solves every problem. I think there's also an issue is that the I mean in the past and I, I think we should continue maintaining that is the projects are not supported by the Linux kit maintainers. So they are more a place to showcase certain things where people can do development. And I think we are quite happy to merge them or provide early feedback on it. Um, so, but it is up to whoever maintains that project to update it. So um, if you have new kernels, for example, uh, we will typically not touch the projects. Um, and that makes it harder to say, I want a merge of all projects. Well, I think with the um, proposal of having a channel where we say, okay, these, these are the features we would like to promote, um, that puts a bit more emphasis on uh, if you make changes, to also make sure that that channel is still working, uh, potentially run, you know, not, not potentially, but also run uh, CI tests, etc., on the uh, promotion channel, etc. So they're they're kind of different different things. But I think it will be quite hard to provide like the the union of all projects and you know, make sure that they still work. Yeah, I think also for at least from from what I've when I went to Tyco, it's we we had an idea about this the the curated channel as Rolf was suggesting of where we have more maintenance and CI running on the channel, but then also separately realize the issue of how do I easily combine two projects and so whether the the tooling exists in the Mobi build tool separately or in a separate tool. Um, that's open for discussion as well, um, and I think it's I think it's good that it's it's kind of it's maybe come out of this discussion and whether we want to separate or kind of keep them in the same discussion. Um, I think happy to follow up on that. So, okay. All right. I'd like to more or less keep to the time limit, but if, if there are any other last. Uh, comments or questions on this topic. I want to make sure we get through most of our other topics today. Um, so in terms of copy and pasting and bit rock things like build systems, I mean, I think that would be better solved by having a make file snippet you could include that includes yes. all the common stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what Justin referred to as um, partially as, as tooling. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, um, and in terms of having YAML files with out of date stuff because it was a snapshot of the time. I mean, so the YAML files you've got to be update to... because I, I I run a set script over yeah, over yeah. YAML files. But there, yeah, well, maybe um, there was scope to have a well, there, dollar the, default the, version of Foo. Well, there, but then that's as of in a minute when I press it, when I fix it. That there's now you can now put multiple YAML files, right? And so you can basically compose them much more easily. So you should be able to. Um, Ideally, make things much more additive, so you can just yeah. say put this on top of the other one to add this feet, this thing. Which, yeah. in theory, as long as it's, I mean, there are some issues around the fact that some things are not very compositional, like kernel kind of sure. but, but the user space stuff should all be able to just be added on as an addition. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, my swarm kit stuff, for example, would be just yeah. another yeah. ten lines in the end. Yeah, and then everything, and also having bases for. Different AWS and things that so you can just layer things on top. So I think if we start moving things to more layered model, it should become mm. more obvious how to add on other stuff. Yep. 
Great. So yeah, looking forward to if there's any additional feedback. Um, the doc has more detailed examples with YAMLs and code, and I think uh, we'd be really excited to get this rolling. So uh, next on our agenda is uh, from a GitHub issue on Linux Kit uh, that I think Lorenzo is on the call, uh, but Lorenzo wanted to bring up and just discuss um, and kind of get some <clears throat> discussion going around build chain security. Uh, in particular, uh, we were discussing uh, position independent executables, uh, ASLR, and then kind of led us to discussion on signing. So I think the way, uh, and Lorenzo, feel free to, to, to chime in yeah. with additional bits mm. there. I have some uh, some slideware on what we do today, what we're thinking about uh, on Linux Kit, but also if, if you'd like to, to, to add anything now about the context when we want to discuss this, uh, that'd be awesome. Oh, I think the issue, so that everyone has it. Um, basically, I was just doing some checks against the executables inside uh, one of the uh, a Linux example I found in the repository, and I noted that uh, the binaries, uh, in particular the CCTL binary, was not um, position independent and uh, as not um, what I want to say the SLR feature. So. Um, after that, with Justin, uh, he linked uh, some um, discussion on the uh, build chain, the, CC, the GCC build chain uh, mailing list that said that when linking against, um, you know, the Muse, uh, you don't have that uh, kind of flags on the binary on the health that says that you uh, are position independent. So you cannot check with the read health that thing. So the concern is, the concern are two, basically, in my opinion, uh, that are, first, uh, we should be completely secure that uh, the binaries are position independent and uh, other space uh, layout of the, uh, um, randomized. And we have to also, we have to check that future binaries that are inserted in Linux builds are compiled with uh, Pi and uh, also, in the other languages, we are opting in like Rust and Camel and everything. And so we have to define some, like, I think that we basically need just a set of checks to, to be completely sure that uh, we are position independent and uh, randomized against Muse, against uh, libc, against everything. So if there's not a tool at the moment that checks that, or we, we should probably go in out and see if there's that kind of tool or if we can build it to have some, um, you know, uh, security of that because uh, we can also link every, we can link every, every discussion, but if you're not completely sure, we cannot guarantee our users that uh, that thing is checked. Okay. So, I basically use the hardening check tool, which uses read elf. That, that thing is linked on the issue, but uh, it doesn't work with Muse. So I don't know how we could probably do that. I propose to re-add to, uh, to some, um, you know, uh, the read elf tool is like, uh, get this compiled binary and open it and get uh, the strings and check if there are some uh, keywords, you know. Um, but an attacker could inject keywords, you know, so it's just a regex. <laughs> um, so, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we could probably, we prefer to actually start a binary and uh, treat it like if it was a malware and check how it uh, behaves and uh, look at its runtime to see if it's using randomized uh, addresses or not. So uh, it, this kind of thing will work with any kind of compile of uh, libc or muse or anything. And it, it, it will be a more uh, you know, costly in terms of computation when we run tests, but uh, will be, uh, we will be sure that we get the results we want. You know? yep. so that's, that's all, that's, that was my concern. Just that. that sounds good to me because I know there certainly are um, currently at least one binary that is um, 
Hey. is not linked correctly, um, which is run C because it's yeah, not even yeah. in. Okay. Although I've added those, those have been up screen now, so we can change that shortly. Okay. But there may well be others as well. So I think that sounds a really good idea. I, just, um, uh, I, I was just saying that we uh, need it probably also for the future because we don't yeah. know if uh, yeah. okay. someday someone compiles something that, you know, Solomon said something like that uh, the, if you have a chain, the, you know, the weakest uh, piece of the chain is as weak as your system. So, yeah, um, I think you can work out quite a lot of it from um, just expecting the ALF files. But um, yeah, I think it needs some further investigation. Um, and someone who understands all the inner details of ALF. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think we'll probably need to modify some of the language configurations as well. So I think in OCaml we need to um, make sure we have the right version of the compiler so that we generate the static Py executable. So it'd be useful to have a tool that uh, that just does this. Um, also, also, is this only for x86 64, or are we interested in Power and ARM 64 as well? Because there was OpenBSD in those as well. It's on an, it's on an every platform. It's not just uh, it's not architecture dependent. It's also Windows, for example. You know, it's on um, everything. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I think okay. some of the um, yeah, I think that the test should mostly be the same on a, on other architectures. I think I can't. Um, I'm fairly sure it's fairly. There's nothing weird about any of those architectures. Well, and there's no. It, it's it's for uh, for you know cross-platform compatibility that I was proposing. Also, the fact that we will check it at runtime uh, and not at uh, uh, checking the compiled thing, so that we don't have to write specific code for each platform because uh, that will be very a, a little tricky. You know, I mean, we are not compiling engineers or something like that. Yeah. I, I think I'm not. I don't, I don't know your profile as well. <laughs> I hope someone is so that we have uh, an easier path through that. So. Yeah, I'm wondering if anyone here may know of, uh, like I know, Lorenzo, you had used a couple of tools and they kind of didn't handle how Go produces uh, position independent executables. I'm curious if anyone here or in maybe the broader community is aware of a tool that is better that we can maybe start with. And then, of course, like, uh, I think a, a better check. Yeah. We can write yeah. one. I, I was a very unfortunate in uh, 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 Googling for that. Uh, I just found the, the, the link that was posted by Justin and nothing else about the topic. So uh, I, I raised the question just for that, because okay. there was no literature. Yeah, one of the things that the Octo Project has been looking at very heavily uh, is this whole issue because there are there are people who build secure, uh, secure binaries and other people who are very much oriented towards building performance on binaries. So uh, that might be a place to look. Uh, I also very much agree that, that there are lots of architecture dependent. Um, flags and um, options when you're building binaries. And so it, in general, it does turn, turn out to be, you have the special recipe for each of the, each of the architectures and sub-architectures. And, and, and if it's this rev of the ship, sometimes you have to have a different, yeah, different. That's a very tough topic. Um, so yeah. Again, Yakta project would be a good place to look and see where people have actually looked at this before. Okay. Thank you. I, I will go through and check. If you have any specific, you know, uh, place on the project to look in that you already seen something, just feel free to link me. Great. Okay, I want to keep time, make sure we have enough time for the demo. So uh, I think I had some questions uh, about how folks uh, 
would be interested in us. We, we sign all our packages as well that we distribute to the Cisco and others. And so Lorenzo and I had an interesting kind of start of a conversation uh, about maybe some more advanced things we can do other than just checking the signature and checking who signed it. Um, and so maybe I'll move that to the next meeting um, and kind of seed the agenda there. Um, uh, and we can discuss that if folks are interested and uh, go from there. So I want to make sure we have enough time. Uh, Anil, are you ready to roll with, with Mirage's DK? I am ready. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is my audio um, stable? Great. That's perfect. So give me a thumbs up. So I will try to share my screen. See yeah. if I can. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. So right, there, stop. there we go. This helps. Awesome. Great. Now, can you see my slides? Hey, can everyone see that? Excellent. So, um, to get started with this, the uh, intention of what we want to do here is to talk about how we can extend uh, the services running on top of Linux Kit to use some of the latest um, um, advances in security and, uh, and features that we have available in Linux. So we've been working on this now for, um, uh, for a little while. It's been Thomas Gazinier, uh, Thomas Leonard, Martin Lucina, Mindy Preston, all of whom are on the call, uh, and myself. And as a disclaimer, this is a very, very early active work in progress. So we wanted to use this community um, to show you what we're working on before the architecture is baked. Um, so we can get feedback on what we're doing wrong. Uh, and also, if we need to make any radical changes in direction, now is the time to shout. So we can, uh, we can avoid making too many decisions. So interruptions, uh, feedback, and uh, you know, patches during the call are all welcome, if you can pull that off. So um, what is it we're trying to do with this particular project? Um, right now, when we first built uh, um, Linux Kit in, in Docker Mac and so on, uh, we wrapped a whole bunch of existing <clears throat> system software that was used in other Linux distributions and put them into containers. So the idea is that uh, we would wrap uh, DHCP, for example, and then figure out how to containerize it, uh, and then commit that configuration into, into the Linux Kit repo. Uh, and similarly for NTP, for, uh, uh, for uh, web servers, and anything else we wanted to put in the, in the, in the base system. Uh, and so Docker Mac has a number of these uh, bespoke services that run um, inside containers. One thing we noticed is that a lot of these system services, despite being containerized, are still written in C. They all have different configuration mechanisms. Uh, for example, there's no structured logging. You have to figure out exactly how to, to route their, um, uh, their traffic. Um, and a lot of them require a lot of system privilege. So um, you have to still give um, the admin capabilities to the containers. And uh, it wasn't a very fine-grained, uh, satisfying mechanism to build, uh, build the software. So, but it's obviously important to get these things bootstrapped. And so everything is now sitting inside containers and nicely isolated from each other. Uh, and we thought that it's the right time to figure out if you wanted to also kickstart a project to make these components less monolithic and more container native. So we want to make these the best way possible to, uh, to write these services uh, and also to fit with the Linux Git philosophy of building a very lean secure container runtime. So what, what I'm gonna present here is our thinking about how we can take advantage of um, almost every security protection available in Linux these days in a practical way in order to rebuild services like DHCP, NTP, uh, and so on, and make them something that we can really stand behind for the next uh, 10 or 15 years as services that um, are, are built using all of the technologies that we're uh, trying to integrate as part of the, uh, the Linux Kit effort. So what's the approach? Uh, Linux Kit has uh, turned into something pretty simple. It has a single build time YAML file. Uh, and everything is specified in there. So it's, it's uh, kind of become a bit of a BSD style distro where you can specify the configuration, you can build a world, um, and uh, you can specialize it to the application as much as possible. So what we want to do with the SDK is to extend this philosophy. So we want to make it easy for developers to build um, privilege separated applications. So if you want to build, for example, um, a service like DHCP or HTTPD, um, there should be a very simple process for you to uh, take advantage of all of this containerization and namespacing available in the next kit. And it's really just four simple things we're doing. First of all, we're specifying the actual process layout of our uh, DHCP service or our uh, NTP service inside the YAML files. We're continuing uh, this uh, process of uh, specifying everything in there, but with a more uh, fine-grained mechanism. We're also making sure that every single one of these, uh, these processes running is as isolated and as minimal as possible. So it has absolutely nothing behind, uh, beyond what it uh, requires. 
So in OpenBSD, for example, this would be done through privilege separation uh, by process level separation. The difference in Linux Kit is that we're extending this uh, separation and we're making sure that everything is running inside its own container namespace as well. So we're extending uh, more beyond, beyond, beyond the more traditional kind of POSIX style privilege separation into uh, everything available inside of modern Linux now. And the hard bit, of course, with privilege separation is just making sure that we can coordinate all of the different privilege services running. Uh, and so we're providing fairly standardized RPC tooling that I'll show that uh, makes it simple uh, to, for the life cycle of these things to run. Uh, and the underlying philosophy here behind the SDK is that uh, just like Docker and like the rest of Mobi, we want to make sure that uh, the developer experience is simple for this. So we want to hide all of the, the complex details of uh, container D inits and uh, starting up these RPC services uh, behind a nice, simple front-end YAML format. And then our tooling can take care of uh, getting these things started. So we're hoping that in the long term that this will kickstart an ecosystem of people building uh, or integrating some of the best of breed security uh, demons uh, because it's so simple for them to get started, like the rest of Linux Kit um, is as well. So uh, the first demon is possibly a bad idea. <laughs> Time will tell. But we actually picked the hardest demon that we could find. And it turned out to be a DHCP because DHCP triggers um, all of the problems with building portable um, demons. Uh, there's different ways to hook into L2 traffic, um, to figure out how to um, uh, hook into your ARP tables to broadcast. Uh, and also for mutating your routing table also requires quite deep system access. You have to have netlink sockets and so on. So normally this is all hidden away behind a, uh, a CapNet admin uh, uh, capability, but it actually gives you a huge amount of access to uh, to uh, lots and lots of things um, that you wouldn't want something that just has to retrieve and set an IP address um, access to. And also there's simpler things. Um, we wanted this DSP client to be customizable uh, to the cloud provider that you're deploying on. So in the case of many modern cloud providers, you only need a one-shot daemon that just runs, sets the IP address, and then in practice, it never changes ever again because we have cloud in it or other mechanisms that mean that uh, we don't really have a mechanism for changing leases. You just destroy the VM and you open it, uh, you start with a new one. Um, so in this case, you don't really want a long running service uh, with its uh, attack services available. So this is a good, good way for us to test out um, uh, and, and, and try out um, um, quite a lot of architectural questions that come up with building, building this. It unfortunately means that DHB is generally quite hard to use and test as well. So it's not been the most accessible project uh, because uh, most of us you know, don't have DHB servers lying around to try out. And so, um, but what we've found is that it's made subsequent uh, implementations such as HTTPS uh, much, much simpler. And if you need any motivation, uh, just click on the, uh, the MITRE link over there. Uh, and you can just see huge amounts of uh, uh, memory exploits and low-level um, errors inside DHCP. So pretty much no, no protocols are uh, immune to this, uh, this particular problem. But I was surprised with how many showed up in DHCP. It's been embedded in uh, any number of systems. So how does it all work? Um, if you conceptually think of a DHCP uh, daemon when you're building it uh, for a client, there's really three different things it needs to do. First of all, it needs to access very low-level L2 networking in order to uh, broadcast the lease. Then uh, it needs to have an engine which actually runs the state machine. The DHCP network needs to parse um, the L2, needs to filter out exactly what it needs to see, and then it needs to turn those into structured DHCP packets. Uh, after that, you want a DHCP engine that runs the fairly complicated DHCP state machine. It needs to look at all of the options. It needs to look at all of the, um, uh, the protocols coming in, and it needs to uh, then figure out exactly what it needs to change from the local, uh, the local uh, Linux system. And to actually do the changes, you need to have access to routing tables. You, you might need to uh, configure DNS and so on, resolve.conf, that kind of thing. And so for that, we have a separate daemon that ha only has access to set that particular part of the uh, Linux, uh, uh, the Linux uh, stateful uh, side. So we have three different daemons as part of our um, implementation. The, the network <coughs> networking, the engine is only the state machine. They can only see the other two processes. And the actuator is the thing that actually makes changes and has access. And importantly, every single one of these processes uh, can run in a separate container. And so it can be written in the language best designed for that purpose. So Rust is really good for building extremely low level uh, syscall uh, things with no garbage collector, uh, and um, we, you know, we think that uh, if we specialize it to just that, we can build a 100 kilobyte container or less just by manually crafting that to be as small as possible. Similarly, so Camel is amazing at building formally verifiable state machines and so on. So it's great for building the engine. Uh, and then you can chop and change each of these um, as, as you go along. So what does the front end YAML file for this look like? 
so this is just a straw man at the moment. This is what we're working with. But I wanted to give you a sense of how it's very Linux kit in its philosophy. So to build this, uh, first of all, we have the uh, DSP network. And right now, it requires quite a lot of um, capabilities. It requires a uh, cabinet admin to um, open up at zero so you can actually uh, look at the raw, the raw networking traffic. And in the future, we hope we can make this more fine-grained because um, we can patch Linux kit to uh, use other mechanisms such as EPPF, for example, uh, in order to uh, remove the amount of capability that it needs from, uh, from the system. But for now, we can just give it that capability and say its only job in the world is to parse network traffic. Um, and there's nothing particularly special about these at the moment. The actuator, which actually sets the syscalls, also needs CapNet admin. So this system is still quite, quite uh, using quite a lot of access capability. But at least what we've done now is we've separated out the concerns so that if we want to specialize the actuator and the ability to sell set syscalls on a fine-grained level, we can do so now because they're, they're running in separate processes. But for now, we're just specifying that they both need the same, uh, the same uh, capability from Linux. And this one also has uh, a directory um, added in there so they can write result.conf uh, because this will actually be seen uh, on the host system from, uh, from the other daemons. And then for the engine, we're getting a bit more interesting. The engine is an extremely isolated process. It's the only thing that needs to uh, parse the state machine. So by default, it should have no access to the outside world. And in this case, we've added a new field called RPC. What this does, it's a bit like the old link flag in Docker where um, it simply says that these other uh, processes, the network and the actuator should be linked via an RPC channel. So whenever we, we compile this thing using, uh, using Mobi build, um, it, when it has the SDK support, uh, it will actually take care of all of the setup of the DXP engine process, and it will ensure that it can pass in a file descriptor from network and actuator so that um, whenever the container starts, it will have two well-formed file descriptors that give it access to, um, to the other parts of the world. But crucially, the DXP engine requires absolutely no external access whatsoever except for those file descriptors. So it can run without a file system. It can run without any real access to the rest of the world. It's just a pure bit of computation that is, is running the fairly complicated bits of the, uh, of, of the world. And finally, we need to specify the init process, uh, which is a one-shot process that uh, runs at runtime. Um, it reads a configuration file in, and then it, it bootstraps all of the rest of them. So with this, uh, we've taken care of specifying um, everything that our, our DSP client needs. It, 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 it actually will, behind the scenes, be running lots and lots of processes, but um, all of this will be hidden away from the user. This is just um, specifying the YAML format so you can see at a glance exactly what capabilities uh, and what system access um, everything has. So how do these things actually communicate? So we're using something called Captain PNP here, which is uh, written by uh, an ex-Googler called uh, Kenton Varda and is used in, um, in, as part of the Sandstorm project. And what Captain PNP is, is that it's quite a high level um, RPC mechanism that is language agnostic. And it provides a number of quite sophisticated capabilities. It's, uh, it provides you with the ability to build uh, structured types uh, inside, a, inside an ideal language. You can see an example of that here in the form of uh, some high-level messages for requesting things to the network or, um, or trying to uh, set syscalls to the actuator. And uh, importantly, it's, uh, it's actual uh, parsing at runtime is very, very simple. So uh, putting in runtime parsing for Captain PNP in multiple languages such as Rust, Go, OCaml, um, Haskell, JavaScript, uh, is a Python is all very, uh, very straightforward. It doesn't impose a huge runtime uh, library service. Crucially, it doesn't require uh, gRPCs, HTTP2, and so on. But it can also be quite transport independent, so we can also integrate it in the future with gRPC if we choose to. But the, um, the, uh, as part of uh, some of our work in this, uh, Kenton has opened up a new GitHub uh, organization to collect all of the Captain PNP uh, community implementations in one place. So he opened this up uh, just yesterday, I think, and we just uh, moved some of our implementations in there. And so it's, it's forming a nice community of people uh, using this for uh, more than just the initial project that it was started from. And so what we want for every daemon is just two things. We want this Captain PNP RPC specification that defines how all of the processes communicate, uh, and that defines the overall state machine for the system. It, it, it says that um, um, uh, the, the, pr the process architecture is, uh, is uh, uh, is, is a named process is running, and then they can communicate only via Captain PNP, and anything else that happens uh, inside the process is done to the process to implement. And what Linux Kit will do is take care of starting the containers with the initial configuration. It'll take care of enforcing that they all obey this Captain PNP 
uh, protocol by, by just checking uh, the containers uh, at start time and it'll connect the descriptors. And then everything else that happens can happen within the, uh, within the container. So I just wanted to quickly uh, demo Captain PNP because I suspect that most people in this call haven't, um, haven't really used it before. In fact, has anyone used Captain PNP before in any uh, big applications? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of uh, nodding heads in my in my uh, thing. So, so it's it's a very impressive project that hasn't really had a lot of um, had of exposure, but it's got a lot of advanced capabilities. So, what what we've done is that uh, Thomas Leonard has put together an HTTPS server. And uh, Thomas, do you want to try screen sharing now to show this? Um, okay. Excellent. So I will stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the main thing I've, I've been doing is working on um, a pure camel implementation of the RPC protocol, because that was that was missing before. Um, this the HTTPS unicorn is just a, a quick demo um, showing how to use it. <clears throat> it's currently um, it's available in a pull request against Linux kit. And you can build it very easily uh, just using just using Docker if you want to test it. Uh, it splits the job of serving um, HTTP requests into three separate components, each of which can be isolated. Uh, there's a store, uh, which is essentially a database that serves up the pages. There's an HTTP protocol uh, process which understands the HTTP protocol, and queries the store to actually get the data. And there's a TLS service uh, which has the uh, the private key for doing um, TLS and it accepts incoming connections <clears throat> and sends plain HTTP and exposes an unencrypted stream uh, to the HTTP component. And all of the um, formats, when you build something like this, you specify them all in a Captain Proto uh, schema file, which I should have somewhere here. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's very simple. The, the TLS service, when it accepts a connection, it creates a new flow object uh, representing that connection, which you can read and write um, plain text data from. Then it invokes a method on the HTTP server, passing in the flow object as an argument. And this is the, the cool feature of, of CAMProto, which is that you can now pass object references around, not just data. Um, the HTTP server will then make callbacks into the flow to, to read the stream and will then call into the store um, to actually look up uh, the resource. And uh, let me get through that for a minute. Uh, so if we test it, uh, well, you can either run it uh, as a single process like this, which is running all three things um, in one place uh, for convenience. Uh, which, which looks like that, that's it servicing a request. I've got rather a lot of debugging in here. Um, or alternatively, um, you can run each of the components uh, separately. So I'm gonna run, for example, the store. And, and that's now just running with the backend database. And we can now connect to that either with one of the other OCaml components or using a component written in, in a different language. So I also have uh, a Python program, which um, just loads that same schema file, connects to uh, that socket, and will just do a simple request for us. So, make sure we're running that. Um, and I just got this working um, this afternoon, and um, I was, I was I was quite surprised because I hadn't done any interoperability testing with this library at all in this work first time. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's essentially, that's essentially um, as far as I've got with that. It's just a quick demo so other people can see how to build this kind of thing. Um, and that's my demo. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, we're a bit short of time, so I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll zoom forward. Now, the important part of, uh, part of this as well is that the, um, the, um, from a security perspective, the, each of the processes has only access to the bit it needs. So um, in, in the case of uh, HTTPS, only the, the key material is um, available to the TLS terminator and uh, the, the files it's serving is available to the, uh, to the 
um, uh, to the HTTP service. So it's, it's relatively simple to use Captain PMP in order to build these privileged set of separate services and to make sure they only have um, access to the minimum uh, capability that they need. So um, when, when, when using Captain PMP to build, to build these kind of uh, distributed uh, processes, uh, we need protection at all levels of the stack. Um, and so one of the things we can do here is that we can look at uh, these daemons from an attack service perspective and say that um, at all levels, um, these new replacement daemons we're building um, have protections available from uh, various parts of Linux capabilities. So at the application level, we're choosing to initially support OCaml and Rust uh, because both of these are statically typed classic uh, uh, languages that provide um, uh, a very nice way to parse network traffic. So although other people can build C-based applications in their containers, we're choosing not to. Uh, and they, they have secure RPC by Captain PNP, so that level of the architecture is well sorted. Um, we're also using bus testing, which is a new magic tool for rapid state space exploration, so that we want, before we submit this to the probationary channel, to make sure that um, we, can actually, um, we can actually test these things. So I'll give you a quick demo of that. The other thing that we're a bit short in time on, um, but uh, I can talk about more, is that the actual runtime processes, as when they're running, um, can actually use KVM hardware protection when available. And they do this by using uh, Unicron-based uh, uh, the Solo 5 hypervisor. And what this does is that if the process running does not require um, access to the, the kernel, for example, the, uh, the DSP engine, it can run itself inside a small uh, KVM-based uh, mini, uh, mini uh, virtual machine and absolutely relinquish access to anything at all by running inside a separate set of uh, EPT-projected um, uh, page tables. Uh, and then even beyond that, whenever you go to the actual interface of the kernel, um, I'm hoping that things like uh, landlock and eBFFA sandboxing can make sure that the syscalls that you do need access to, can, we can provide very, very fine-grained access to. And all of these things um, are relatively easy to add in incrementally because we can, we can depend on other probationary projects uh, and we can try out, for example, eBPF and make sure that it, it interacts well with the rest of the, rest of the system. Um, in some cases, we'll probably need to um, extend some of these, for example, uh, to patch a kernel for uh, various eBPF facilities, um, and Linux Kit provides us with a way to make those changes in lockstep and and make sure that exactly what we need is um, is available to the uh, to the developer. So um, this is something we want to expand more on the the um, the structured ability to look at this and to figure out exactly um, uh, which attacks uh, we we want to focus on and which ones we want to uh, figure out. Now we're running a little bit short of time, so uh, I won't give you an in-depth explanation of UKVM, but I can do that later on um, as part of, um, yeah, we've, we've demonstrated uh, the, the basic unit kernels running several times. But the idea here was that um, you, can, you can use Solo 5 in order to, inside a process, um, quickly demonstrate, uh, demonstrate uh, how to uh, run a unit kernel inside uh, a normal container DBase container, uh, and then have all of the channels set up running over RPCs. This, the bit that I think is one of the most exciting, it's also one of the areas that I think we need to do a lot more of, on, of in Linux Kit, um, because this is uh, something that a lot of other projects have had a lot of success finding security holes with. And this is something that we're gonna throw all of our demons at for quite a long period of time before uh, declaring the production worthy. And this is fuzz testing. So if um, AFL is something called um, the uh, American Fuzzy Law, and what it does is that you can instrument a binary with AFL, and it throws lots of random input in the program, and then it breaks it and, it and it fixes it. And so Mindy Preston has been doing uh, a bunch of work in order to make sure that we can fuzz test all of our new demons from the ground up. So um, I think we just have enough time and I will um, hand it over to Mindy. Now I have got um, an ASCII cast, which is the latest in uh, technology. Can everyone see our ASCII cast? Okay, so I'm gonna play this and Mindy, if you wanna start uh, introducing it. Sure, so um, this is just a quick demo of a uh, DHCP client that we're using to, uh, as the prototype here. Um, this is the, uh, what is the equivalent of the DHCP engine bit of this code uh, from Anil's earlier diagram. So um, I'm gonna build it really quickly. I'm gonna show you how it works. Uh, I'll build it properly. There we go. Um, so the output of this is a Unix binary that we wanna run. I'm just running it natively on my system. I'm gonna give it some input um, which happens to be uh, the equivalent of a network packet. And I've, uh, I've set it up so that the file descriptors it wants to talk on are standard in and standard out. So um, we'll, we see the network output um, on the screen here. I actually can't see all of this, uh, so I'm doing my best to narrate it. Um, I think there's a, yeah, there's some stuff that I would be saying down at the bottom if I weren't actually talking to you. So uh, if we actually just feed it a constant stream of random bytes, 
we see that the client is not responding to any of those because they're just random garbage. It's continuing to send its DHCP discover packets. Um, so we can do better than that if we use AFL fuzz's instrumentation. So um, I'll show you in just a second here what it looks like when we do that. Um, when we run AFL fuzz, it will be able to hook into um, hook into this uh, these this standard in um, feed it uh, feed it input that it then correlates with the path discovery that it's done. So it'll be able to see um, okay if I if I twiddle this one bit, I get the same execution path as I did before, which is probably that the packet is not invalid and it's immediately discarded by the processor. Um, but it will uh, use um, it will basically mutate the uh, mutate the input until it finds something that discovers a new path and then continue attempting to explore the set of things that cause the program to have different behavior within that path whether it's discovering uh, whether it's discovering new execution paths discovering crashes and recording them for us um, or dis or discovering timeouts so this is what afl fuzz looks like when you run it um, against a particular binary um, you can see up top there's uh, um, on the right where you see overall results it'll tell you this is how far I think I am in discovering the behavior of this program given whatever arbitrary input. Um, and another piece of in interesting information is in the bottom on the right where it says path geometry, where it tells you um, how, many, uh, how many paths have been discovered so far, uh, which paths look interesting, how many are pending. Um, in the middle on the right where you see findings in depth, once it starts discovering crashes, that's where you'll see them. They'll be in bright red and AFL saves them so that you can um, then use them to iteratively fix the bugs um, that you discover in your program. Uh, a small correction, unfortunately, AFL doesn't fix the bugs for you, you or someone who else, someone else who works on your project has to do that. Um, but it can help you uh, get past those first, those first 10,000 times that your thing tries to interoperate with something else and you discover a problem. So sorry for the whirlwind, hopefully that was understandable. Thank you, Mindy. So um, what we've done is we've, we've put a lot of pieces together to show you. So um, the the end to end system is not yet working. We're hoping to get it um, uh, finished by the, by, the, by, you know, by the Mobi Summit with all the, all the various pieces put together. But um, what I've hoped to show you is that we're trying to build security in from the ground up. So instead of um, just picking one technology, we're trying to um, uh, fix the uh, developer experience. Uh, we're trying to make sure we can have fuzzing all the latest uh, mechanisms for, for the dev workflow uh, working from uh, day one. Uh, and also to take care of the things that have historically stopped people from building privileged uh, services, privileged separated services, um, things like uh, the um, uh, the tooling around the RPC and the and, and the setup. So um, if you have any ideas for other uh, services that we should focus on, we're initially doing DHCP, DNS, and HTTPS, <laughs> uh, and hopefully NTP, but uh, uh, we still have to finish an NTP implementation. We're trying to make the config interfaces as similar to existing demons as possible, so we can swap them out. Um, and our goal is um, that we should convince you as a security community that um, these are safer and they're better and they're as reliable as, as existing services, but with a significantly better set of protections with all of the latest uh, security technologies that we find um, in, uh, in, in the various parts of the, the, the Linux ecosystem. Um, initially, a lot of this is very Linux specific uh, because we depend on containerd's uh, you know, latest features with FT passing and so on uh, for it to work. But we'd really like a lot of this stuff to eventually be portable to, you know, for example, FreeBSD and OpenBSDs. Uh, various protection mechanisms. There's nothing inherently landscape specific except the tooling is initially uh, focused around that. And uh, we also uh, want to make sure that the Mobi CLI uh, will be able to package these up. So if you um, have other distributions you want to add support to, you should be able to as well. Um, because the Mobi CLI is going to be uh, uh, having support for devs and RPMs uh, in the future. But overall, um, our goal, uh, and we're really excited about this, is that we genuinely want to build an ecosystem for practical, correct by construction services. Uh, we want to support as many languages as we can find. Uh, we, we don't want to take a position on you know, which language is the best language and so on. We simply want to um, have uh, standards for things like the RPC mechanisms uh, and also just take care of all of the gory details of containerization and capabilities and just make it easy for developers to start, uh, start building these. Uh, and then using uh, things like fuzz testing in order to, to actually build an objective testing function for us to determine which are the best ones from a security perspective. And hopefully, eventually, we can all work together to try to classify the CV database in order to figure out um, where all the attacks are coming from. Right now, we, it feels we have this huge flood of attacks coming in. Uh, and by building, taking a more structured approach like this, we can start to categorize them uh, and determine where in the long term we should focus our attention on for, uh, for, um, for, for base system services like this. So it's been a stream of information. Um, if you have any time, I'd love to uh, you know, take any questions, or um, we can take that on, um, offline as well. 
Yeah, and just I noted in the chat, but I'll be collecting the slides and posting them with the notes. So if anyone wants to deep dive on any particular slide or click through links, uh, they'll be up on the repo shortly. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of PR slides in Linux here as well. So we you know, really encourage just people just asking questions or you know um, questioning decisions. Feel very free just to jump in. Even if you don't have full context on why something is, we're happy to explain more and uh, document it as much as we can. Yep. I think, Anil, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think everyone who's working on uh, this project is on the Linux Kit repo, uh, in the community Slack channel, on the forums. So if you have any questions or comments, suggestions, I think any or all of those places are good forums for that follow-up. And also, if you have any, any ideas of uh, interesting places to deploy some of the early services, like DHCP, for example, where there's exotic and uh, you know, um, terrifying traffic, that would be most interesting as well. Cool. All right, thank you very much, uh, Anil, Mindy, uh, uh, Thomas. Um, I think I have one last slide. I don't want to keep everyone too much past time. So I have one last slide just for the next meeting of four pointers. So let me share this. So next week we have, or next time will be in two weeks on June 21st. Uh, I have us scheduled for a deep dive on the landlock LSM, which as we mentioned, uh, kind of came up in the Mirage demo is uh, an eBPF based LSM. So uh, Mikael is the, the, the lead maintainer. Um, and has been helping us with including the patch sets uh, in the Linux Kit project. Uh, and we hopefully will get a, a nice update of the, where the project is now, uh, as well as what you can do with it. So it should be really exciting. Um, if you have any additional topics, I know today we didn't get as much discussion in on signing, uh, which I'll propose, but uh, if there's more follow-up on particular Mirage SDK uh, bits or other bits of Linux Kit, uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly or uh, it, the agenda will be posted as a markdown file in the repo so you can open a PR if you like. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to call a wrap for today. If you have any feedback about the SIG, how it's run, how we can improve, please uh, feel free to read out, reach out to me directly um, or we can discuss in the forums. Um, and thank you all for coming. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you.